I am declaring war against the drug. Sa barangay Santo Cristo naman, neto ang naspotted. Huwag mularan ali ang shampoo. Yan ang nakasulat sa placard na ito. The family have been holding vigil, trying to raise enough money to have him buried. This is part of the new war on drugs in the Philippines. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching a special edition of The Listening Post, focusing on journalism in the Philippines. When he came to power last year, President Rodrigo Duterte vowed he was on a mission to eradicate the country's drug problem. The casualty figures since then make for difficult reading. Nearly 8,000 Filipinos have been killed. Around one-third of those deaths have come at the hands of the police with no regard to due process. The rest of the victims have been shot dead by unknown assailants in a shadowy wave of vigilantism unleashed, critics say, by the rhetoric coming out of the president's office from Rodrigo Duterte himself. Just this past week, a retired policeman in the southern city of Davao said that Duterte was running death squads during his time as mayor there starting in the late 1980s. And that former policeman confessed to killing people on Rodrigo Duterte's orders. These days, what the president likes to call his war on drugs has become a national story, and it's a challenging one for journalists to tell. In the capital, the steady stream of violence has created a new beat for a group of photojournalists. Go to a police station in downtown Manila, and you will find them gathered there, waiting for news of the latest killing. Then they hurry to the scene to try to get a shot of the body and the details of the story before the authorities can clean up the site. We sent one of our producers to the Philippines so he could spend a few nights riding alongside those news crews. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now, embedded with the journalists Filipinos call the Nightcrawlers of Manila. The campaign against drugs in the Philippines will continue. And it will be relentless. And I will not count the dead bodies. I will just say, continue to destroy the drug apparatus. If you do not do it, it will destroy our country. Make your choice. It is Monday night in the Philippines, and the small press center in the Manila Police District, the MPD, begins to fill up. These photojournalists document nightly bloodshed in a campaign that President Rodrigo Duterte says will rid the country of its drug problem. Since Duterte came to office, more than a thousand Filipinos have been killed a month. The current death toll is around 7,700. Two out of every three victims aren't killed by police, but by vigilantes. Tonight at the MPD, it takes a while, but after five hours or so, the call, the news tip, comes in. It's just before 1 a.m. and we've received word that there's been a killing in a northern suburb of Manila. Monday nights have been especially deadly here. One theory for why that is is that the perpetrators like to rest over the weekend. So come Monday, the killings resume with renewed vigor. We get to the scene and it's already cordoned off. A man, we were told, had been killed by police in his home. Moments after his body is brought out, we get another call, another tip. Another man killed in his home. But, unlike the first victim, he was not alone. His partner, eight months pregnant with their first child, tries to provide answers in a case that will join thousands of others just like it. We would see two more lifeless bodies that night. The total reported death toll, 17. For these photojournalists, it's just another night on the job. But of all the killings they've documented, one stands out. It happened last July. A pedicab driver, Michael Sharon, was shot dead by assailants unknown. It immediately struck us that it was a very different image because most of the time, even families were not allowed to go inside the police line, but the partner of uh, Michael Sharon was able to cross the police line and refused to be uh, controlled by the police. And we saw how she pleaded for help and she pleaded the uh, media for help. There wasn't really anything that we could do. I know it sounds horrible, uh, but in fact, it was a beautiful photo. 
The reason why it looked so good was because uh, TV networks had reached the scene. Their OB vans had the floodlights are on. So the, the, the camera lighting actually uh, made the contrast stand out. And, you know, it was the man who was killed and his wife, you know, uh, cradling him. So classic, you know, I mean, thousands of years of, of art, you know, I've, I've thought that. And it's a classic scene. The way the elements came together it was a no-brainer for the front page. And we played it up. And, you know, we got a lot of criticism. And you are portrayed in a broadsheet na parang uh, Mother Mary cradling the dead cadaver of Jesus Christ. Ayan yung mga yan eh. Magdramahan tayo dito. Why did it move President Duterte so much? One, we're a very Catholic country and that, that photo looked like the Pieta like the Virgin Mary, who is much revered in the Philippines. I think the president thought that it was staged. The message he sent out was that photojournalists were trying to make addicts into martyrs, which is absolutely untrue. The truth coming out from the lens of this one photojournalist was very inconvenient for the president. But that's the way it is. People are gunned down. Women, mothers, daughters, wives come out, scream and cry, begging for help. And that's the truth of life in this country. That image has been taken advantage of by so many uh, media networks. You might be looking at it on a different perspective, as we do, right? We are law enforcers. If what they see is, is just is murder. But if you will see the effect of this on the part of uh, our peace and order now compared to the peace and order before years back. It's very, very different. So we have gained this momentum because of this war on drugs. It's not only domestic outlets that are criticized for journalism that the president does not like. Last December, the New York Times published a photo essay entitled, They are slaughtering us like animals. It was produced by Australian photojournalist Daniel Barahulak, who says that he photographed 57 homicides over 35 days. The piece quickly drew condemnation from Duterte's office, which called it one-sided and said that it depicts the Philippines as the wild, wild west, which is far from the truth. Last month, Amnesty International released a report that said police officers are incentivized to kill, not arrest, during these operations. It accused officers of planting evidence at crime scenes and taking kickbacks from funeral homes in exchange for bodies. According to Amnesty, Filipino police and others have created an informal economy of death, which bears striking similarities to what it was like in Davao City when Duterte was mayor, as described by Arturo Lascanzas, a former policeman who, this past week, said that he was paid to kill criminals and Duterte's opponents including a radio journalist in 2003 who was a staunch critic of the then mayor. The police's involvement in Duterte's so-called war on drugs is currently on hold while it says it will root out corruption within its ranks. As witness to countless murder scenes, these journalists have a unique insight into how the police have conducted this campaign. So we asked them how that relationship has developed over the last seven months. During the start of the campaign against drugs, I think that they needed the coverage to let the people know that there's an ongoing campaign against drugs. But later on, as the stories produce a lot of negative effect, the police has been more silent about uh, the cases and that it made it uh, a lot more difficult for us to get to the crime scene. A lot of the times when we get there, the bodies have been taken away. We're not even, we don't even know if uh, the crime scene has been processed properly. We are told um, they, are, they were rushed to the hospital. We don't know if, if the victim who was shot is dead or if he is alive. And sometimes the yellow line gets farther. Sometimes it's nearer the, the body. Sometimes it gets farther. Basically, nothing is being uh, uh, hidden from these media people. 
in some of our operations, basically, we let the media go with the police operatives, especially if the situation permits it, and uh, we do not put the lives of uh, the media people in danger. But there's also, I think, a danger that um, having to be embedded in these police operations could mean sometimes what we give in return for continued coverage. Philippine outfits have been very good in presenting the human dimension. But we're just really at the tip of the iceberg because we haven't really gone down and linked together the real big story, which probably is that there is very little distinction between narco gangs and law enforcement in this country. That connection has not been made and the media environment in the Philippines may have something to do with it. Journalism here comes with risks. In 2009, 57 people were murdered, 32 of them journalists, in a politically motivated attack in the province of Maguindanao. No one has been convicted in the case. And according to media rights groups, that's typical because in the Philippines, 90% of the media killings since 1992 remain unsolved. This past December, a newspaper publisher, Larry Kay, was shot dead in what looks to have been a vigilante killing. Kay had recently written a column accusing local authorities of negligence in a drug case. No arrests have been made. There is little indication that the situation will improve under Duterte. Just before taking office last year, he said that journalists are not exempt from assassination and that those who had been killed were probably guilty of something. So for the journalists covering the story, there is a legitimate concern that their work could get them killed. I don't see President Duterte destroying the culture of impunity. If, if anything else, I see him strengthening this culture. The whole atmosphere created by President Duterte allows anybody to ride on his vilification campaign so that it will be all too easy to muddle the truth, make it all the more harder to find out who or what is killing journalists because the entire political landscape is so toxic. The environment for our work is so much more hostile now. You have a lot of maybe supporters uh, of the president who pounce on you if you make the slightest mistake. Even if you don't make a mistake, they will accuse you of a systematic bias against the president. So you get a lot of these very hostile comments. There is an attempt to deflect the blame back on the journalist. So our worry, my main worry, is the online abuse going offline. Another night, another race to one of the poorer parts of Manila, which is where most of these killings are taking place. The drug problem in the Philippines is hardly confined to the working class and poor, but they have borne the brunt of President Duterte's campaign. Again, shortly after arriving at the first scene, word comes in about another killing. En route, we come across a body in the street. We stop to find out more, but are quickly back on the road. Traffic fatalities are no longer newsworthy in the Philippines. With the overwhelming majority of these killings concentrated in poor communities, where loss of innocent life is dismissed as collateral damage in a larger necessary conflict, where rudimentary investigations have been carried out by a police force that stands accused of profiting from its own violent crackdown, the question for journalists is whether to call this what the Duterte government calls it, a war on drugs. I think we should be asking ourselves that question every single day. It seems convenient, and in fact, that's what's going for the phrase. It is a convenience to just say it's a war on drugs. But the phrase slow motion genocide occurred to me. Because what kind of war is it where, you know, there's no fighting back? The journalists began by giving the president the benefit of the doubt. He called it a war on drugs, but I think somewhere along the way, we have to stop 
just taking the president on face value and instead call the spade a spade. What is happening is a war against civil liberties in this country. Polls suggest that most Filipinos back the president's so-called war on drugs. But would that be the case if journalists called it, as some have, a war on the poor, a war on civil liberties? When the president's terminology is echoed in the news coverage, it reinforces the notion that the victims are culpable and that those doing the killing are not. The president became who he is today precisely because he was not held accountable to his words. He is actually building the foundation that will make it easier for Filipinos to accept the chipping away of democratic foundations we've fought for and died for. And if journalists focus on this, I think it will allow people to look deeper and see that around all of us, the blocks that may eventually trap us in a regime of autocracy are slowly going up. That is the story in the Philippines. Every night, families chase after the bodies of their loved ones, not knowing how much it will cost to get them back. And a president who has openly endorsed a killing spree that has no end in sight. So for now, it's the country's slums and back alleys that are under attack. Tomorrow, who knows where this story will take them? The Nightcrawlers of Manila. Viewed from the streets or through the lens of a news camera, what President Duterte calls his war on drugs is a big news story presenting serious logistical difficulties, but also opportunities for frontline journalism on the human consequences. And it's a difficult story to interpret in that it features a population that seems to be living in fear. According to the polling data, most Filipinos, at least in theory, support the so-called war on drugs, but they oppose the unaccountable killings. As for the president, he's called out his own police force for corruption, but is himself facing serious allegations of wrongdoing. One of the leading Filipino news outlets on this story is Rappler. It's an online platform that also advocates for journalism as a potential source of solutions to the country's social problems. Rappler's editor-at-large, Mary Tess Vitug, has also worked for foreign news outlets such as the New York Times. Her investigative journalism has won awards and led to threats against her. I spoke with Ms. Vitug about the challenges of reporting on the so-called war on drugs under a president whose contempt for journalists resonates with what we're seeing in other parts of the world where the populist right finds itself in the ascendancy. Marites Vitug, editor-at-large at Rappler, thanks for joining us here at the Listening Post today. Rappler often criticizes President Duterte's so-called war on drugs. Yours is not the only news organization to do so. There's also been plenty of criticism from overseas, yet the polls seem to indicate that the president's policies remain popular with Filipinos. How would you explain that? You know, there is a dissonance in the recent surveys. While surveys show that Duterte enjoys uh, you know, certain amount or high popularity, uh, the Filipinos who responded to the polls say two things. One, they want the drug suspects taken alive, majority of them. Number two, majority of the respondents fear that they may be the next victims of the war on drugs. So there's a dissonance in the surveys. Now, reporters are taught in Journalism 101 to follow the money. Our piece referred to that Amnesty International report that referred to what it called an informal economy of death. Stories of police officers being paid per body, per encounter, is the euphemism that they use. Uh, the money that is changing hands between the police, funeral homes, and other organizations. How big is the economic angle in the overall story of President Duterte's so-called war on drugs in the Philippines? You know, I believe that this economic angle that the police getting paid for kills is the oil that greases this killing machine. Yes, the media should continue looking at this angle of uh, money for, for killings. But the challenge really for the media is to look for new ways of presenting this same story. It has to 
look at angles that have not been touched on before. What has been not really reported on is the state of the institution today, the state of the police force. Duterte has called them rotten to the core, that 40% are corrupt. What is their state now? Are they demoralized? Do they still want to pursue the war on drugs? What real reforms are taking place? Two weeks ago, President Duterte quoted Donald Trump directly, saying, urging the public not to believe the media. Are Donald Trump and President Duterte roughly on the same page when it comes to their approach with the news media? And if Duterte is out to discredit journalism in the Philippines, to what extent do you believe that he has succeeded? There is some similarity between him and Trump. Now, what Duterte is trying to do in the Philippines is to trump the media, to use that word, is to discredit us and to make us less legitimate in the eyes of the public because many in the mainstream media tend to be critical of his war on drugs and not just that, his other statements and, and policies. And instead, he wants his supporters in the social media to have a stronger voice, to really give more space and, and voice to the pro Duterte social media bloggers uh, who are quite popular in the Philippines. But I don't think Duterte will succeed in really discrediting the mainstream media because there is also a long track record of credibility of major media outlets. So it's not that easy to, to trump us. The media in the Philippines, like the media in the United States, are both in a post-electoral phase. In the U.S., many news outlets have been forced, after the election of Donald Trump, to do a little bit of soul-searching regarding their coverage throughout the primaries. In the Philippines, what role did the media play in President Duterte's rise to power, and has there been any soul-searching occurring within the media there? Looking back, I think the fault of the Philippine media was that we did not take Duterte seriously. We only took him seriously maybe in the last month or the last two weeks of the campaign. So that was our fault. We did not do enough research on him. We did not dig deep enough. We wrote about the killings in Davao, but not uh, thoroughly. We didn't really do... a an extensive and intensive profile of this man, this mayor of the city from, from the south. We only were awakened, we were, you know, jolted by the survey showing him leading in the last two weeks. So that was our fault. We did not take him seriously. Reporters are having difficulty, actually, in conducting real press conference with our president, a real conversation because his press conferences tend to be monologues. He doesn't want to be interrupted. He hardly completes a thought. So the reporters are scared or intimidated to ask follow-up questions. So uh, our stories are, are not complete. I want to ask you about journalist safety in the Philippines and the issue of impunity. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, a New York-based organization, 90% of all cases of journalists who have been murdered in the Philippines since 1992 have gone unsolved. Is that something that is felt in all sectors, this kind of impunity when it comes to cases of murder, not just in the media, or are journalists, when it comes to this kind of thing, in a special category? No, I don't think journalists are in a special category because we have the same case with judges. In the Philippines, a num many judges have already been killed, and of course, now in the war on drugs, it's the poor suspects who are being killed. So it's just that we pay attention to our colleagues who have been killed because, of course, we have this duty to report on what's happening in the Philippines and in corruption in government or uh, what the powerful people do. So we like to give a special regard for our colleagues. But in that sense, we are not any different, as I said, from, from judges and from the poor people who are now victims of drug killings. One final note on terminology. It's been said that the term war on terror masks what it really is, a war on Muslims. And that in reality, the U.S. version of the war on drugs amounts to a war on African Americans. In the Philippines, the overwhelming majority of casualties aren't drug kingpins or gang bosses. They're a long way down the supply chain. And with the death toll approaching 8,000, it's up to journalists to decode the terminology. The Filipino version of the war on drugs looks very much like a war 
on the poor. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.